Hello and welcome to the home of Africa's youth. This is The 77%. We're here once again to have a chat with an African personality. She's an internationally recognized satirist and speaker from Botswana, and she calls herself a Pan-Africanist. Sianda Mohitsiwa is my guest. Hello, Sianda. Nice to have you here on The 77%. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to talk today with you. It's really great to have you on. Now, I have to be honest, the first time I heard someone describe herself as a Pan-Africanist by birth was from you. Now, is that just because your parents are from Botswana and Swaziland? Um, The short answer is yes, technically, (laughs) but also because I felt um, that the only way to kind of make peace with those differences and this constant feeling of out of placeness was to develop a philosophy or adopt a philosophy that allowed me to expand the idea of identity, of being Motswana, of being Swazi into something much larger than I had initially thought because when something is too small for you to fit into it, the ideal is to make it bigger, to mm. expand it. Mm. Yeah, I mean, obviously, when we talk about Pan-Africanism, the, uh, the, the issue of identity comes into play. Uh, but we'll delve into that uh, in a bit. Uh, for now, what does Pan-Africanism mean to you today? It's a recognition of um, the artificial differences that have been imposed upon the continent in the colonial projects and in other various um, economic and historical events. Um, to recognize that borders that are drawn physically on maps... Um, don't actually represent the best interests of the African nations that they divide and delineate. Um, And more than that, it is kind of an understanding that whatever problems, that we will be the ones to rescue ourselves. Because not only do the borders represent an allegiance to colonial history and other types of histories, um, our leaders who ostensibly represent us actually have show more allegiance to something else, either um, their own personal gain or a hunger for power or whatever. So it's like we are left to rescue ourselves. It is up, it is up to us to inspire one another. Yeah, I think I think you make a very valid point talking about um, artificial borders that were created for us. However, of course, that doesn't um, uh, delete the point that we're still quite a diverse continent. So how realistic is it that uh, we as a people can share an African identity in such a diverse continent? In the project of nation building, at least in the modern world as we understand it, post-independence and before then um, as colonial territories, we've been given this idea that to be, to have an identity or to have a nation requires sameness or requires the removal of any kind of friction or of individuality or of like cultures that have evolved to have specific values and systems and stuff that to in order for us to be real countries or real nations we have to squash all the differences which is just fundamentally untrue because the reason why diversity is an ideal that a lot of places are now starting to recognize that one should work towards embracing the differences is that it is actually a beautiful and inspiring and really genius thing about the human um, species that we've managed to create societies and civilizations and histories that are so different, that look at the world in such different ways. And so for a Pan-Africanist identity, the point is um, not mono-Africanist, but Pan-Africanist, the, um, the philosophy of, of, of pulling it all together, recognizing the differences, celebrating them, um, but also realizing that Politically and economically, it is much more in our um, interest to focus um, to focus structurally on the similarities and historically. Um, is this you trying to, you know, create some sort of USA, United States of Africa? Is that a realistic image in your mind? Well, the USA is not doing great. <laughs> that would be a little childish of you or a little tone deaf. Um, But it is an ideal to have a collection of people like the European Union, like China, like the world actually is made up of all these conglomerates, so to speak, um, different peoples coming together. South Africa is a key example of that. You have 10 to 12 Bantu tribes there that have lived in coexistence um, 
that have coexisted that have coexisted um, peacefully for the most part and in ways that kind of celebrate each and everyone's difference. Um, but the ideal, I guess, structurally would be to 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 find an African version mm. that kind of gets the best part of the idea of United States, mm-hmm. um, that gets the best part of the European Union outside, like ignoring Brexit. <laughs> <laughs> and just kind of looks at the way that the world has been able to come together in like these global um governments and 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 um institutions just we are very capable of inventing something mm. that suits us and that is better <laughs> yeah yeah. yeah, that that I would agree with you. I think definitely we are more than capable of doing anything, really. Uh, now, you've said before that, that the best way for Africa to share its successes is through social pan-Africanism as opposed to political pan-Africanism. Uh, can you elaborate? Political pan-Africanism is like what I consider like the institutionalized version of it, of, you know, something like the African Union or SADC or like these kind of bodies these governance bodies that bring together leaders and bring together policymakers and all that stuff to talk about Pan-African ideas ostensibly. Um, But in my opinion, there's been so many um, moments where more could have been done. And ultimately you realize that the gap exists because it's a bunch of people who have power and have a totally different experience of their countries coming together and talking about solving the problems of a continent whose people, some of them, truly hold in contempt. I mean, the idea of, let's say, a nameless tyrant who terrorizes their people going to Ethiopia at the African Union to represent their people, I think we're seeing now in the world that that model is unrealistic mm. and is actually not in the best interests of everyday people. So the reason I, I believe in the social Pan-Africanism is that it is only we who live and experience the problems that we do who are capable of recognizing that in other people. Yeah, so basically, like, we cannot rely on people representing us who have shown repeatedly that they do not, in our own countries, have our best interests at heart. So why would they have them when they go abroad? Um, so social pan is the answer to that. Mm. So give me a typical example of uh, social Pan-Africanism. Um, a typical example of social Pan-Africanism that I, I often think about is kind of the spread of political um, discontent, so to speak. Um, how something like fees must fall or in Cape Town led to roads must fall, led to other po- like anti-colonialist um, sentiments spreading around the region, mm. um, led to just a complete reawakening and an expansion of what is possible, right? Because usually the thing about politics or political change is the key is the imagination. Like how is our imagination expanded? Um, and our imagination is expanded by social pan-Africanism in the sense of seeing what the Namibian youth has managed to do. Mm. Um, seeing that they are up against similar um, restrictions and they have managed to do it. So why can't we? So that's what really so Africanism is when we see on social media what Tanzanian activists, Kenyan activists are doing, what Burundians are doing, um, and feeling like we can do that too. Mm. Yeah, well, that's that's uh, duly noted. Now you write about a lot of uh, different things. You write about a variety of issues, including uh, black consciousness. So I am black and conscious of that fact. Is there more to that? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, Yes, uh, black consciousness is this concept that um, was kind of birthed and cultivated by Steve Biko, South African um, philosopher, um, an, act, an anti-apartheid activist who unfortunately died in prison, in police custody. I think that's the better way to put it. So basically, it comes down to this. The way that South African laws were written was that at the center of of apartheid state was whiteness as the objective middle ground. And this is something that's also being talked about here in the United States, of what happens when one group of people is tasked with being the right people or the normal people or the objective viewers of everyone else. And 
So basically, like when when you were living in South Africa at the time, you were white or you were non-white. Mm. So even in your non-white existence, it was it was the whiteness was the was the sun around which you orbited. It was the point of departure. It was the reference point of like either I'm white or I'm not white. So black consciousness is a decision to put yourself as the sun in your solar system mm. to put blackness and the the lives of those who have not benefited from oppressive states um, to be at the center of their own fates and rather than reacting um, constantly kind of catching up or reacting or like protecting oneself oh just kind of interacting with whiteness as this daily um, mm. and philosophical means of self-identification mm. you find what it means for yourself to be black and for that to be the middle for you i think um it, it's valid what you say about uh, not waiting to react but also initiating actions uh knowing who we are uh, i will definitely keep that in my pocket so, so you rightly said um, in in your response uh, that you in the u.s you moved to the u.s uh, four years ago to study uh, fiction i understand uh, now what are your thoughts about uh, the black lives matter movement especially after george floyd was killed honestly i'm not going to lie to you just to be very clear i'm incredibly surprised every day by the progression of this uh, moment in american history I mean, one can understand at this point the kind of pessimism that African Americans must feel um, in a system in which <clears throat> repeatedly the same things are done to them and each time they still have to prove that those things hurt. And I can imagine that there's kind of um, a hopelessness that is that is built into being in this segment of society. So when the George Floyd thing happened, I think a lot of us in the in the world in general, Americans included, thought it was going to be one of those things where it's like, oh, this video, Trayvon Martin, whoever, and it kind of just blows over eventually. Mm. But for some reason, this came at the exact right moment in American history, which is that a pandemic meant that everyone was home for the most part, that now you had a viewership of these videos of police brutality that was unprecedented. Mm -hmm. um, and you are also having a moment in time in which the American government is not just failing black people as it is designed to, but failing entire swaths of the country, failing regions, failing demographics, failing um, people who had always believed that it had the, their best interests at heart. This pandemic has shown that um, either state governments or federal governments are capable of failing their citizens as much as they fail you know, so to speak, black people. Mm. And so I think white Americans are in a position to now know what it feels like to be disregarded by people, by a system you've invested in. And so I think they see what happened to George Floyd for the first time, I think, in American history as something that could happen to them. Yeah, and I mean, it's, it's a bit sad that even in 2020, we're still talking about uh, uh, Black Lives Matter. I mean, it's not even something that we should be talking about because... Da, right? But yeah, if we if we want to talk about this, we'll spend uh, thirty hours delving into that. But let's talk about satire now, because you're a satirist, and that's uh, one of the main things that you do. You created the satirical hashtag if Africa was a bar. This went viral in the summer of 2015. Uh, tell us more about the brain behind that and what you achieved with it. I had been on quote unquote African Twitter by necessity because Botswana has like three people. So I had to follow <laughs> um, Africans from everywhere. And what I began to notice was there was a, a lot of these like um, playful kind of fights that would break out of like, oh, like Nigerians are better than Ghanaians or like Kenyans are better than South Africans. Just kind of these silly types of things. But I realized that that was the chief engagement across borders. And I thought that was just not an accurate representation of what we are capable of um, as, as people on this great continent. Um, so I thought that it would be important to try to find ways to make those same international discussions happen, um, but in a positive light, in a playful way, in a way that kind of talks about how we are much more similar than we think. And so these types of hashtags I had done, like Africans in high school and a couple of others, um, just to kind of say... What, it, what would it be like if we were all in the same place? Mm. And how would we show ourselves to be different from each other? Mm. Which is kind of 
hence back to your question initially. Um, because it says if Africa was born, what would your country do or what would your people do? Mm. And it gives us a chance to kind of present ourselves to each other in a new way. Um, and I think a lot of us learned so much about um, our perceptions of ourselves. And um, we learned what Basutu think of themselves. We learned mm. what um, Kings think of themselves. And that's a totally different relationship mm. than... Yeah, I got one for you. you. I got one for you. If If, if Africa was a bar... Ghanaian would be sipping on beer with a Nigerian, discussing what else to compete about. How's that? Absolutely. So that's a good Absolutely. one. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. Now, um, honestly, I wish we had uh, forever to talk. Uh, it's it's pretty interesting getting to know more about you and and, and the brain behind the things you do. Talking about the things you do, what project are you currently working on? Yes. Um, at the moment, I have a novel, um, and I'm also beginning um, to work towards my doctorate at the University of Chicago um, in sociology. Um, so that's kind of what I have at the moment. I'm also working on a few video projects. Um, I have my YouTube channel where I routinely bring, put up content. My most latest video was um, a celebration of blackness of um, in an attempt to raise money for Black Lives Matter. It's just me dancing, <laughs> but um, something I enjoy very much. So that's kind of what I'm about. If you follow me on Twitter, you get the updates. Um, and I'm just working towards narrative construction mm. making my novel mean what it needs to mean in this moment of time mm. um so on yeah i mean it sounds like you have you have a you have a lot on your hands you're like an octopus you're doing so many different things at the same time what do you do in your spare time <laughs> <laughs> oh my god um in my spare time um i'm looking at my like whiteboard where i like map out things that i'm supposed to be <laughs> Um, in my spare time, I really enjoy, um, in the quarantine, I started learning how to make clothes. So that's what I do now. Okay. I, um, I sew and I construct things and I try to think about like the African relationship with like tailored wear and thinking about how do I bring that into this like American space that I'm in where everything is like disposable. Mm. Um, and thinking about like the philosophies that I had growing up with our traditional attire and kind of how seriously we take it. Mm. Um, so that's been a nice part of self-discovery for my own Africanness and like mm. um, craft. Yeah, oh, sounds good. Maybe when you when you manage to do some clothing for for guys, you can always hit me up and maybe I could try it on. You know, you... absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Now, before we wrap it up, people want to get to know even more about you. Uh, what's your favorite food, your favorite music, and your favorite sports, if you have any? <laughs> oh, good. Okay. Um, I guess my favorite food at the moment is I'm, I'm I'm wanting to like be more conscious of like baking, but bread specifically. I really want to um try different breads from all over the world, try different flowers and stuff. So that's something that I'm working on now. Um, as for music, Burner Boy shaking um i'm also into a lot of um, black women rappers you know megan the stallion cardi b like um it's a nice moment actually in like music history for black um female artists mm. and spotify it's like streaming services give women dark-skinned women women who would not have had chances um in the mainstream ways to like get at us and it's really an exciting time i have a playlist on spotify i can make public i don't know um, as for sports, I don't even know what that means. <laughs> like, what is, is that? Like, what do people do with that? <laughs> <laughs> okay, clearly that's that's not your thing. That's okay. It's okay. We'll, we'll accept that. I mean, but you make a, a good point about music. Music definitely is a, is a key tool to spread message. And recently, Beyonce uh, releasing that album, Black is King. Uh, that's a good one. I'm sure you're delving into that, right? I mean, she's really a gem. I think the one thing about her that I we, I think people forget is that she did not go to university. She's been a musician, full-time musician her whole life. So she's actually an autodidact that, that you know, she's someone who has taught herself mm -hmm. about Black consciousness and Black history and, like, all these things. And so we've been lucky to watch the evolution of someone over all these years who is kind of discovering and, like, celebrating Blackness and using her power mm -hmm. um, to bring in as many different types of 
representations of blackness as possible, I highly recommend Homecoming. I was really blown away um, because I think I didn't know about black sororities and black fraternities mm -hmm. until I came here. You learn about Howard, you learn about Morehouse, all these like black institutions. And she gave them a chance to shine, to show that these like musical genius at these schools. Yeah. And I think that's an amazing thing. Yeah, for sure. I'm a, I'm a Beyonce fan, so I don't want to blush while I'm talking about her. So I'll just move on uh, to my next question. Uh, do you have any plans for your home country, Botswana, uh, within your field of work or, or any other plans? I would really like to see a more concerted effort in terms of like labor rights and labor opportunities. And this is just what I feel everywhere in the world because what's happening is like people, companies see what they can get away with in other countries and then they just kind of, so the way we are like um, resistant to Pan-Africanism, the idea of like things being similar is not the way companies are. Companies are like, oh yeah, of course, if this works in Tanzania, it's probably gonna work in Swaziland. And so they figure out how to erode the rights of the ordinary African workers and spread that around. So my my plan for Botswana is the same plan I have for Ghana, for anywhere else, of like being, as a people, really conscious of labor rights and what our work time is worth and not being slaves to debt and, and all these institutions that do not care about us, um, if that makes any sense at all. What are your final words to all the young Africans listening to you right now? you are capable of more than you have been told. And our only job right now is to expand what we think is possible in the world. Um, I do want to back go back to the Ghanaian thing because I realized it's, it would be so strange for a Pan-Africanist to not mention Kwame Nkrumah. Mm -hmm. and his yeah, that's right. That's weird of me to not say that, <laughs> but you know, he's the father of this philosophy and, um, was able to like literally do things that we don't think are possible. So especially I think we should remember his legacy because not only did he help in the freedom of African people, he helped in the freedom of African American people, mm. which is something I think we're not paying attention to right now. So I guess my message to young Africans is to say, not only is our issue on the continent about recognition of one another, we have to understand that it also has to be in connection to our African brothers in the diaspora and that what happens to them here is happening to us too, you know? Mm. Um, so for me, it's like, let's remember the, the legacy of Carmen Krumer who understood that Pan-Africanism could not stop just in our borders, yeah. in our continent, the Atlantic Ocean, had to come to the new world, so to speak, where our people also are, yeah. you know? Yeah, that is a great way to wrap all of this chat up. Now, from the scale of one to 10, uh, before we started this interview, I, I liked you eight. Now it's 10.5. How's that? I love that. That's a huge <laughs> Thank you. Okay, internationally recognized satirist from Botswana and Pan-Africanist Siyanda Mohutsiwa. Thanks a lot for spending your time with us. Okie dokie. Now, thanks a lot to all of you guys that tuned in. Also, I'm sure you've been inspired a lot. There's only two things you have to do now, yeah? Just share this chat across your social media platforms and subscribe to our YouTube channel, DW Africa. Until the next time, it's bye for now. <laughs>